Thanks everyone for being here. Um, before we start, uh, just let me say thank you very much for your time, for being here. It, it, I'm very happy that you are here. Um, my name is Mauricio Teixeira. I work for Red Hat. I've been at Red Hat for about 14 years. And I have God knows how many years of working with <laughs> computers in general. Uh, I'll, I'll just go over the presentation um, and have the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, so you can go ahead and you can write your questions on the chat or on the Q&A feature and I'll take a look after at, by the end. Um, sorry. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, sorry, just one note. Uh, I have been asked why I, I, I wrote how Red Hat ran a global open VPN solution in, this, in, in the uh, presentation. But uh, it is because when I actually wrote, the, started talking about the presentation, I thought that by this time we would be over the, the pandemic and we're not. <laughs> so that's why I renamed it and it's not ran anymore. It's still the way we are still running. So this is what I'm gonna to talk today. Uh, I'm gonna to give a little bit of uh, who am I and talk about what Red Hat IT infrastructure does, how we uh, have our corporate VPN solution, how we present that, how do we uh, support it. And then we, uh, we're gonna go over the actual thing that we, how did we prepare for the COVID pandemic and what we're gonna do in the future after all of this. So why should you listen to me? Like I said, um, I have many years in IT infrastructure and 13, 14 years of Red Hat. Uh, right now I'm working at the team that is called uh, Unified Infrastructure and Operations. And I'm one of the technical leads and one of the next gen data center architects. And I manage a lot of different services inside VPN. The main products that I actually manage are the OpenVPN and DNS solutions. Uh, but I'm also a subject matter expert for a lot of other things. Those are only the things that I actually touch in the sense that I actually do some work writing code or managing, but I, I also have to work on architecting a lot of different stuff inside the company, helping uh, people to actually design their solutions, etc. cetera. Um, I, I put this slide, I don't know why. There's been a lot of discussions about why I still use the sysadmin title it's just a title. Uh, these days, DevOps, Sysadmin, SRE, they are all cobbled together. You may say otherwise, people may think different than that, but it's uh, everybody's doing basically the same thing, managing systems and writing code. That's what everybody do, does at those, those days. So what exactly does, uh, what a Red Hat infrastructure does? Basically, um, we are the corporate side of the company. Um, you can uh, more or less say that Red Hat is divided half engineering and half corporate, more or less like this. And we are part of the corporate side of the company. We take care of everything related to the corporate infrastructure. All the things that are needed for the company to actually run, to actually uh, do their everyday work, like uh, the finances, sales, and everything related to maintaining a company. So basically when you look at our team, we are basically any kind of IT shop, a regular IT shop like any other one, IT shop. So we have basically the same problems as anyone else that is actually in this conference today, same everyday problems. Uh, our offerings, um, and, um, high level offerings here, we work, uh, we offer compute storage and network. Uh, and when you look at compute, we have uh, a mix of um, private and public cloud offerings. And we call this the op open hybrid cloud solutions because you can actually deploy your application anywhere you want. And we have many different solutions, many offerings anywhere. Uh, storage, we also have different vendors, different types of storage. And network, and network wise, we actually offer uh, network connectivity for all the offices in, in the entire company and also all the data centers that uh, Red Hat manages, uh, including data centers which host 
uh, community projects, for example. There, there are a lot of community projects which are sponsored by Red Hat, which uh, live inside a, a given data center or some other given data centers that my team also manage, help manage, not the project itself, but the infrastructure under the project that the project needs in, in order to be able to be in the data center itself. Uh, we are an actual global team, a true follow the sun team, like I, I like to say, because we have people all over the globe. Uh, on, the, on this side of the screen, I'm not gonna say left or right because I can be confused. Uh, on this side of the screen, uh, you can see all the offices where uh, we have Red Hat IT presence, but the, the ones highlighted are the ones where we have IT infrastructure presence in the sense that we actually have a person doing infrastructure in the office. Or in some cases, I also pointed out data centers in some situations. But we also have a lot of infrastructure people who are not even in the offices. They are actually working from home somewhere in some other parts of the globe. So complicated, we have really a lot of people. And, but talking about our VPN solution, what do we actually use VPN for? So um, some people may question, why do you still need VPN, right? Well, um, even though we, still, we, are, we all live in the cloud world where you can have all your stuff in the cloud in whatever cloud vendor you want, uh, you still need to have a way to access the resource or to, or to protect the resource somehow. So in our case, we actually have to protect those resources because some of those, they are internal only. Again, like I said, even though we are an open source company, we, we provide open source software, we provide open source services, we still need to be a regular company that we still have a lot of private data like financial data, institutional data that really cannot be exposed, right? So uh, part of this, we, we hide behind our firewalls. Also, um, we have to prevent the oops situation, like uh, people can make mistakes and, and make something public that should not be public. So uh, we at least have some kind of a, a preparation before it actually goes to the outside world, right? But we still, like I said, you, we, we still have our private cloud infrastructure. So we have one cloud inside the firewall. We have another cloud outside the firewall. We have multiple types of clouds everywhere. And also never forget that there is a lot of things called regulations everywhere in the world, different countries that have different requirements for different things. So we need to be aware of those. And that's why we, we need to keep these VPNs up and running. Um, the way that we run VPN, basically all our VPN servers, they are basically running on top of virtual machines. And today, those virtual machines are basically running on Rev, the, which means Red Hat Virtualization, which is our um, um, most uh, common product for virtualization, been around for years and years. Um, we, on top, of, in, on top of those, Red, which are Red Hat Enterprise machines, RHEL machines, those VMs, they run uh, OpenVPN software. And we actually use the OpenVPN itself. We don't use the, the paid version of OpenVPN. We use the open source OpenVPN version. And um, we use the strongest encryption that we can. And the, uh, we use 2FA for authentication. So we, we have tokens, uh, software tokens, hardware tokens, uh, whatever you wanna use. People can choose whatever they want. But um, it's necessary that we use 2FA. And that's a um, suggestion for everybody. Don't forget to set your 2FA, whatever you have an account, online account that uh, gives you the ability to use 2FA, please enable 2FA, give you more security. Um, our global VPN solution has global reach. We actually have uh, VPN servers in multiple locations. In some locations, they are actually inside an office and in some other locations, they are inside a data center. Uh, we have to do that for many reasons. Uh, we have some local resources which need to be uh, accessed faster. Like one example, imagine someone uh, in Australia, for example, trying to access a server 
it's very slow for them to access a server in the US. So they have some servers local in Australia, so they don't have to cross the entire ocean, right? And we have other situations where uh, I, I will not name countries where there are restrictions that uh, the servers need to be local. Or in other situations that you cannot open a VPN connection to the outside of the country. So there are many situations where uh, which forced us to, to create those local regional VPNs. And also there is the um, latency, right? Uh, <laughs> the globe is enormous and we still have not beat the speed of light. We still need to take that into consideration. So lat latency is a factor for anybody that uh, needs access. And we as Red Hat Infrastructure, we care about providing the best reliable connectivity for anyone. So for example, if you are in any given country uh, and you need to access uh, any resource in another continent, and uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that your connectivity from your house is going to be the best possible. So we provide you a way to reach out to our services with uh, the minimal latency that we can provide because we have agreements with uh, many uh, partners to provide connectivity across, across the globe. And um, last but not least, we, we have uh, automatic location selection and fall back to secondary using uh, smart DNS and uh, smart location, which I'm gonna talk about later. Um, this is basically an overview where our corporate solution, our corporate VPN is located, all the places where uh, we have uh, some sort of uh, VPN connectivity. Um, I actually forgot two locations here. Well, well I'll, I'll fix that for the next time. <laughs> um, so uh, related to, to the open source things that we use, remember that uh, when I said the, uh, the title of this presentation is that we use 99% uh, open source things. So these are basically the open source bits that we use. We have Red Hat Enterprise Linux and we have Red Hat Virtualization. Uh, Red Hat Virtualization is basically the name of the product that we uh, provide to our customers, but uh, the overt project, overt project is the actual open source project. And, um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is also open source and the equivalent that anybody can go and download without any problems at all is uh, CentOS or Fedora. They are all equivalent, uh, even though uh, Red Hat is also free to download, but there are some restrictions. Um, uh, we also use Ansible um, for our configuration management. We have both uh, a uh, combination of uh, Ansible Engine, which is basically when you run Ansible playbooks from your laptop or from a uh, command line, cron job, whatever. And we also have uh, Ansible Tower that we use for orchestration. Since in Ansible Tower, we can actually create shared playbooks or shared workflows that a lot of people can use. We can create one single workflow to do, let's say, for example, to uh, provision a VM somewhere and any given developer, they don't need to know the details about how to provision a VM. All they need to know is click three buttons and eventually they got um, 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 a VM somewhere. Uh, we do that using Ansible Tower. We still have a little bit of Puppet in, in our infrastructure. I'm not gonna lie. I could come here and say a lot of things that are really not true. I could hide a lot of skeletons in the closet, but I don't think that's, that's valuable. I actually have to say that we still run Puppet in, in a lot of our environment. And uh, we actually have a combination of Ansible and Puppet. We are transitioning out of Puppet, going to be 100% Ansible. That's what I, um, if you remember one of my uh, initial slides, I, saw, I said next gen data center, that's basically what we're doing. We are transitioning everything from uh, Puppet and standard infrastructure to infrastructure as a code using Ansible. Um, so, like I said, proprietary bits. We actually do use some proprietary stuff. And those are basically, we use info blocks for the client side DNS resolution for corporate and internet hosts. Basically, uh, when anybody connects, connects to the uh, VPN or if they are sitting in any given office, they use info blocks as the DNS resolver. 
it was a choice that we made just because of uh, different requirements that we have in our network. Um, uh, there's no point in going over this. I could give an entire presentation about our DNS infrastructure, why we chose Infoblox, but we still have bind. Um, we still have bind as our core infrastructure DNS. It's still there. And we also analyzing, looking at different other solutions like um, um, core DNS and, and Prof 53 and other DNS uh, solutions, unbound, et cetera. It's a mix of different stuff, uh, but for the, per, for the purpose of the OpenVPN, uh, Infoblox is what we use for client resolution. And we also do some, a, a little bit of protection with response policy zones. Basically we have lists of um, uh, sites which are considered malicious. And when someone is connected to the VPN, uh, we provide Infoblox as a primary DNS for them. And every time they try to resolve something, uh, they go over these lists and just to make sure that they don't get, uh, they don't get scammed, fished or malware or whatever. Um, we also use Akamai. In this case, uh, I actually should uh, edit this slide and say that it's actually Akamai DNS. We don't use for OpenVPN itself, we do not use Akamai as a content provider. We use Akamai as a DNS solution. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that uh, on next slides. Uh, there's a slide just for talking about Akamai. Um, and uh, the other proprietary part is some uh, software that we had to run on Windows and Mac for, uh, it needs to be proprietary because of compatibility with the way that uh, uh, we provide the corporate management for those laptops. And, but, um, Obviously on Linux and mobile clients, we actually use the, the official OpenVPN open source client. Um, like I said, um, Akamai, uh, why do we use Akamai for? And this is very interesting part. This is something that I'm very proud of because I work on this for a long time. Uh, we actually use Akamai GTM, Global Traffic Management. And when, whenever you get uh, whenever you get a hold of these slides, you, there is a link to how GTM, there's a link to the explanation on how GTM works. But basically what happens is that when someone uh, tries to resolve the DNS host name for our VPN, they reach out to Akamai. Akamai will figure out where in the globe they are. And Akamai will say, okay, so this is the closest country for you in case it's a country level thing. But in case, it's, uh, in case it's inside a given country, okay, inside this country, I have these locations, these cities, these states, and then I, I'm gonna select the best one for you. So for example, if you are in Europe, um, if you're, let's say for example, in Italy, we do not have connectivity, we do not have OpenVPN in Italy, but we have in different countries. So uh, they will choose, Akamai will choose which one is faster, which one is closer to that person at any given moment. And if you are, for example, in the United States, it will choose between the East Coast and the West Coast. And then uh, once that country is located, uh, the, it will select the, the appropriate data center for that particular country. And then finally, it will connect to the VPN server. Um, so how did we do all our preparation for dealing with COVID? Um, well, everybody was hit by surprise with uh, lockdowns and changes in behavior, working from home and everything. But uh, Red Hat has been Red Hat has been using OpenVPN for many years already, many many years, and uh, we have been slowly managing the load based on different patterns and we, we have growth in this area or in that country, or we have a different um, um, uh, traffic pattern in any different uh, VPN server. So that, that was basically how we were managing, like just waiting for someone to come to talk to us and say, hey, this VPN server is not good for this, these people in this location, or we have this situation in this country or in this office that we should probably have a VPN for this location. So we have been more or less kind of reactive in that regard. But uh, coincidentally, a little bit 
a, a few well a few months before uh, the pandemic hit we were actually preparing for a lot of stuff and uh, one of the stuff that we were preparing was the uh, the Akamai global server selection that was the thing that we have been working for a long time even before the pandemic hits but uh, once the pandemic actually came uh, we started looking at what else can we do to improve and mind you we actually started talking about these topics even before the lockdown started because we said okay what if this is something that um, is part of our job is part of uh, our daily job is we need to think about the, the next thing even though we have to focus on making sure that the lights are on and everything that we have today is working as good as possible we also need to think about what is the next thing in the next year or the next two years three years whatever we always need to think ahead and maintaining what we have today so um even before the lockdown we were already thinking what we're going to do next what can be done so um when it actually happened uh we were more or less prepared for dealing with the situation because we already had a lot of VPN servers spread across the globe, right? And basically what we had to do was uh, build additional servers in some locations so that uh, we would prevent issues like availability. It's not, more, uh, in some locations, it wasn't a problem about capacity. We had plenty of capacity in some of those locations. Uh, the problem was more related to actually availability. And then in some other locations, we had capacity problems. And, and when I say capacity, I actually talk about IP range. It's not about CPU memory or anything. It's basically, or bandwidth. It, it was just about IP range. We, we didn't plan for having so many people connected. So we actually had to increase the IP ranges. And we made educated guess, uh, guesses about what, how many IPs we should put in, in any given location. And eventually we just said, you know what? Let's just put as many IP addresses as we can in every single location, and then we don't have to worry about it anymore. So um, we, we, we made that selection and we started doing this implementation. And then we, we increased the level of monitoring everywhere, uh, putting more detailed monitoring on, in terms of um, availability, like making sure that any given uh, server is accessible both from an internal perspective and from an external perspective, because we have had one situation like in, we weren't monitoring internally. The server was, uh, we could ping the server, the service was up, the service was reachable inside the firewall, but not from outside the firewall. <laughs> and so we had to implement this kind of monitoring as well from outside the, the network. Actually, um, one of the things that um, Akamai gives us is this intelligent um, monitoring for availability if by because for any given country and i'm gonna go back a little bit just use this example let's say for example you are in in europe like i said someone is in italy they have in europe one europe two option and uh akamai is able to know not only which one is closer and faster for them to connect but also they are able to say, this one is alive, this one is dead. So I'm gonna flip to the other one, even though it's not the faster, it's not the closer, but at least it's alive. So the same thing we do for, for example, in Latin America, even though there is a, there is a, um, a Europa VPN server in Latin America, local in Latin America, if this one is not available, then anybody in this region will connect to the US. And we don't have to worry about it. The customers don't have to worry about it. It's one single profile. They click, I want to connect to the VPN. I don't have to worry about where I'm going to. Uh, Akamai will do that selection for, for us. Um, so we also implemented our other uh, metrics, uh, basically looking at uh, connection authentication attempts and looking, we know an average of how many people are supposed to be connected at, at any given time, or we know uh, how many uh, successful connection attempts should be at that one particular point of time, and we monitor those. We also look at authentication response times and disconnect reasons. Disconnect reasons is important because 
uh, we can identify, for example, whether the disconnection has been made, has been caused by our side because our server ran out of resources and disconnected the user, or because on the user side, they had an issue with their connectivity, routing, whatever, and they disconnected, or they disconnected because they really wanted to disconnect, they just clicked the disconnect button. We, we actually have a way to see this. Um, this is this, the specifications of uh, any given OpenVPN server. We standardize it in a minimum here. And this minimum is, I'm gonna be honest, the minimum is already a lot. Uh, as you can see on the last line, we barely touch when we have 2000, all, over 2000 simultaneous users, you actually, we actually have only 6% CPU usage. So uh, it, it's really, like I said before, the, the capacity problem was not about CPU memory, it's about IP ranges or availability in any given location. It's not about CPU or anything. It's a very lightweight protocol. Uh, some interesting metrics to mention here. Uh, we did uh, roughly uh, an average, we did an 100% capacity increase, in, but in some locations it was actually 200% increase uh, we have a 65% usage peak, which means basically at any given point in time, we have the equivalent of 65% of our entire IP allocation, the entire globe, I'm not talking about one specific location, I'm talking about the entire globe, 65% of uh, 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 available connections are being in use in, in the peak usage. Uh, the minimum is 5%. Uh, we never go below 5%, which means there is always someone connected, even on the weekend. Now, the people who connect on the weekend doesn't mean necessarily they are working. We do have a lot of people working on the weekend because uh, we still have to support our customers, right? But also we have a lot of people that they connect and forget. I have done that before. I had connected one time and I forget it was connected. My laptop was on all the time and I don't know, I was connected for a, a week probably. And, and then we actually have a, a disconnection, automatic disconnection on our server side, just to make sure that people don't forget this. And we, we set it for, I don't, sorry, I don't recall if it was five or seven days, but we actually do some force of disconnection after some time. So uh, I actually wrote a little bit of a timeline here just to, um, I, I wanted to organize my thoughts. Uh, and I think it's also useful to, to see how uh, we have been proactive in many senses. So as you can see, um, January 30, uh, the World Health Organization issued a global uh, health emergency. They said there's this disease and it's important and everybody should be aware of it and should be prepared for doing what needs to be done because it could be a problem for us. And on January 31, Red Hat issued an internal communication about, so we are aware, we are looking at what we're gonna do and we're starting to make decisions. Like for example, uh, we, we ask people to be careful about traveling, for example. And that's when, uh, at this particular point of time, we were already talking about what we're gonna do with the VPN. And, but the company came um, and, and said, yeah, um, travel restrictions, so more people working from home. And then um, around February 4, we started looking at the um, Asia VPN servers because that's where um, all the lockdown actually started. People started working from home more from, the, uh, from the, that part of the world. And then we realized there was a, an increase, um, uh, an increase of 75% in increased usage in that region. But the, 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 the region was already over provisioned. So uh, we were not too concerned. We are monitoring close, but we are not too concerned. Um, we started thinking about the other regions of the country. What if that actually spreads, right? So uh, we started adding server in specifically in the USA just to increase re reliability, like I said before. And then um, in March 4th, they actually shut down, uh, started shutting down stuff places in the United States. And I'm, I'm sorry, it, it sounds a little bit like I'm focusing on the United States, but that's because the majority of the um, um, 
the majority of the Red Hat associates are either in the United States or in, in regions close to the United States or use the VPN in the United States because even um, some people who are in other um, um, continents in Europe or Asia, they still prefer to connect to the, uh, to the VPN servers in the US just because it's easier for them, it's better for them. Um, so um, in March 6, we started giving uh, new resources for VPN, right? Uh, we had, came into production with the, uh, the Akamai solution, the auto selection. It was already there, but it was not public for everybody. And, and then that's when we turned it on and we started distributing. Um, right at Red Hat, everybody, um, most of the associates, they have their laptops that they use for, uh, they have configuration distributed to them automatically. That's when we told everybody, we gave everybody the single configuration. And then on March 11, uh, the, it was declared a pandemic officially. And then we started closing Red Hat offices. And that's when everybody went home and then the VPN uh, increased, uh, the VPN usage increased a lot. And then we decided to double capacity before we actually had any issues at all. So uh, usage spiked around uh, 20%. Uh, so sorry, this 20% is actually for new associates connected to the VPN, which means people that uh, they were actually working from, off, from, from the office, they moved to work from home, they never connected to the VPN before and now they are actually connecting to the VPN. But the, we actually had uh, more people more regularly connected to the VPN than we had before. And then uh, we kept going, uh, looking at everything and making sure that everything is stable. And, and we got to a point where two weeks later, we did it, we realized a global increase of 35% in simultaneous connections. So, and we, we said, okay, we're fine. Um, we're good now, we have enough. Uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Red Hat for being um, a great employer because on May 20, they uh, created what is called the Red Hat Recharge Day, which is a day um, every quarter that we associates have the ability to just take the day off. And it's just a free day off for us that we enjoy and we go out and we do whatever we want. It's great. And it actually happened uh, uh, last week and we, it was a happy day. You can see on Twitter what people have been doing. That is a hashtag recharge day. Uh, sorry, that was a bad slide. It wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, so what we're gonna do in the future, um, in the future, we are migrating, like I said, we are migrating everything to Ansible. We still use a little bit of Puppet, but we are migrating to be 100% Ansible, um, to orchestrate and automate every single thing that we're doing. Uh, some stuff is a little bit manual. Uh, we're going to migrate as much as we can from Red Hat virtualization to OpenStack, just because we want to use OpenStack auto scaling capabilities and some other capabilities that uh, Red Hat virtualization does not have. Um, and we are going to support IPv6 connectivity, which is um, a big thing these days. We already have internal IPv6 at Red Hat, but uh, we're now opening up for people to connect from home using IPv6 to the VPN. And that should solve a lot of problems, right? <laughs> Related to IP ranges and everything else. We will not worry about IP ranges anymore. That's not gonna be a problem. Oops, I forgot also to remove that little thing. So this is all I had to say. I really appreciate your time. Uh, it was great uh, having the opportunity to share this story with you. And um, I'm here open for questions. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know exactly how these slides are gonna be shared. I know they're gonna share the, the recording later. If they do not share the slides, uh, I will post uh, some way to share. I will use my, my Twitter in order to share the slides. And thank you so much. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, did you see the question that you guys had from Brian Brock? Uh, yes. Um, one second. Do you have further plans to develop your infrastructure to respond to COVID or is the deployment of software 
to deal with COVID complete? No, it's, it's never complete. Um, we, the only thing that uh, on the OpenVPN point of view, uh, like I said, the thing that we are preparing to do is basically to um, move from Red Hat virtualization to OpenStack. We're gonna use auto scaling capabilities because right now um, we're just using, like I said in the beginning, in some locations we have one single server, in some other locations we have two servers and they, they were deployed manually. We actually have to click on a button and say, give me one more server. And we have to maintain those servers. We actually have to do patching. So when we, we have to reboot one given server because of um, a glibc or kernel update, um, everybody on that server gets disconnected. So we need to be able to spread connections across more servers so that we can actually do maintenance without impacting people. So instead of a, impacting, I don't know, three, 4,000 people at once when, when you reboot a server, you're actually gonna impact only 200, 300. It's not gonna be so bad. Uh, from, the, uh, from the general Red Hat infrastructure, um, we, we have been working on improving our data centers because more and more stuff are running inside our data centers or in our cloud solutions, in our virtual private clouds or VPCs inside whatever cloud vendor we use. And uh, the majority of the software that we have been de deploying for uh, Red Hat Corporate, the majority of the software is actually being deployed in OpenShift in, as containers. Um, those are the main things that we have been doing. I hope that answers your question.